Hey everyone, welcome back to my series on the ICD-10 CM 2021 coding guidelines. Today we're going to go over section 1B, which is the general coding guidelines. If you're new to my channel, I'm Victoria Moll. I'm a medical coder, auditor, educator, and content creator. And please make sure you go back and watch the first part of this series because this video is part of a very long series I'll be doing on the ICD-10-CM coding guidelines. So let's get into it. So last time we ended here at section 1B, the general coding guidelines. So some of this we already covered a little bit more in depth in my video on ICD-10-CM basics, like the locating a code in ICD-10-CM. So check that video out because it'll give you some really good talk throughs of how to look up an ICD-10-CM code. So the locating a code in ICD-10-CM, you always start with your alphabetic index. So why is that patient coming in? What's that diagnosis? What's the reason for the visit? And then verify it in our tabular list. We never code directly from the alphabetic index. And then once we're in our tabular, we check those additional guidelines that are in there. If there's like a use additional or see something else, or code first guideline, make sure that we check that. Make sure that we code to the full extent of the code. If there's a seventh character available, we have to use that seventh character and put in those placeholder X's that we talked about. Uh, and it says a dash at the end of an alphabetic index entry indicates that additional characters are required. So sometimes the alphabetic index will tell you that you need you know, additional character and that'll be indicated with a dash. Even if there isn't a dash, make sure you go back to the tabular list because there may be additional guidance never code directly from the alphabetic index. Next is the level of detail in coding. So diagnosis codes are supposed to be reported at the highest number of characters available. ICD-10-CM diagnosis codes are composed of either three, four, five, six, or seven characters. Codes with three characters are included in ICD-10-CM as the heading of a category of codes that may be further divided into uh, needing four, five, or six characters, each of which adds additional detail onto that code. A three-character code is to be used if it is not further subdivided. Perfect example is the code I10, which is a uh, full code for hypertension, and it's just three characters. A code is invalid if it has not been coded to the highest number that is needed, and it does need, for example, a uh, fifth or sixth character. The codes go from A00.0, .0 through T88.9 and then Z000 through Z99.8. The appropriate code from those ranges must be used for any diagnoses, symptoms, conditions, problems, complaints, or reasons for the encounter or visit. Next is signs and symptoms. So codes that describe symptoms and signs as opposed to diagnoses are acceptable when we don't have a definitive diagnosis. So say a patient comes in and they just have abdominal pain and we have to do further testing on them to find out if it's you know gallstones or appendicitis and we don't have that definitive diagnosis, they have to go out for additional testing to the hospital or wherever. You can just use that code for abdominal pain even though it's just a symptom. We don't have that definitive diagnosis yet at the time that we're billing out for that data service. It's fine to just use abdominal pain. Chapter 18 might have a lot of those. Those are codes for symptom signs and abnormal clinical and lab findings. So that might have some of them, a good amount of them, but not necessarily all of the signs and symptoms. Conditions that are integral to a part of a disease process. Uh, signs and symptoms that are routinely associated with disease process shouldn't be coded additionally. So if a patient has the flu and they also have a fever, well, typically patients who have the flu do run a fever, so you wouldn't code flu and fever. You would just code the flu, influenza, because typically having a fever is part of that uh, integral disease process. Now, conditions that are not an integral part of that disease process can be coded additionally. Not everyone who gets the flu maybe gets a rash, but this particular patient, for whatever reason, is breaking out in hives. That's not something that's normally associated with that disease. So in that case, we could code additionally for a rash. Multiple coding for a single condition, in addition to the etiology manifestation convention that requires two codes to fully describe a single condition that affects multiple systems, there are other single conditions that also require more than one code. And that's when you will see the use additional code that says in the tabular list that we need to include 
any additional codes that may need to be uh, part of that primary code. If it says to use an additional code, those additional codes that you're using come secondary to that other code. For example, it says here bacterial infections that are not included in chapter one, a secondary code from category B95, streptococcus, staphylococcus, and enterococcus as the cause of diseases classified elsewhere, or B96, other bacterial agents as the cause of diseases classified elsewhere may be required to identify those additional uh, bacterial organism that's causing the infection. So when it says use additional, those are the codes that you're going to use as secondary codes. We also have code first notes. Code first notes are under certain codes that are not specifically manifestation codes, but may be due to an underlying cause. So when it says code first, that thing that has to be coded first gets sequenced first and then the underlying conditions. When it says code first, that means that code that you're supposed to code first should be sequenced first and then the other codes after that. When it says code, if applicable, any causal condition first, that note indicates that this code may be assigned as a principal diagnosis when the causal condition is unknown or not applicable. If the causal condition is known, then code for that condition, the causal condition, uh, as the principal or first listed diagnosis. Multiple codes may be needed for sequela, for complications codes, and for obstetric codes to fully describe a condition and see those specific chapter guidelines for those. We're going to go over those chapter specific guidelines in some of our further episodes. Acute and chronic, if the same condition is described as both acute and chronic and separate sub entries exist, not a combination code, we code the acute condition first and then the chronic condition. A good way to remember this is ABC, acute before chronic. The acute gets coded before the chronic condition. So if we can look at an example here, um, kidney disease. So if you look at acute kidney failure, you can have acute kidney failure. Whoop. You can have acute kidney failure and chronic kidney disease at the same time. So you can code for N17, which is the acute first, and then you would code the N18 and whatever stage it is for the chronic kidney disease. Now in those instances where we do have a combination code, a combination code is when we use a single code to classify two diagnoses or a diagnosis with a secondary process or a diagnosis with an associated complication. If a combination code exists, you should be using those, that combination code and not the two codes separately. In this example here, we have A69.23, which is arthritis due to Lyme disease. So there's a different code for arthritis and there's a different code for Lyme disease. But if we have arthritis due to Lyme disease, we would use this combination code, arthritis due to Lyme disease. A sequela is the residual effect of a condition produced after the acute phase of the illness or injury has terminated. There's no time limit when a sequela code can be used. Residual may be apparent early, such as a cerebral infarction, or it could be months or years later. Uh, examples include scar formation, that's a big one. If a patient has some kind of wound or surgery that later on they have a scar from, you could use a code for uh, the, that wound and then that sequela extension for the scar. Uh, deviated septum due to a nasal fracture, infertility due to tubal occlusion from old TB. Generally, uh, coding of sequela requires two codes sequenced in the following order. First is the condition and then second is the sequela. So if in the case of a scar, you would first code the scar, and then the second would be the wound with that sequela extension character on it. There's some exceptions to these guidelines, and those are for instances where the code for the sequela is followed by a manifestation code identified in the tabular list, or the sequela code has been expanded at the fourth, fifth, and sixth characters to include the manifestations. The code for the acute phase of an illness or injury that led to the sequela is never used with a code for the late effect. Impending or threatened condition, code any condition described at the time of discharge as impending or threatened as follows. If it did occur, then it is a confirmed diagnosis and we code it to the confirmed diagnosis. If it did not occur by the time of discharge, reference the alphabetic index to determine if the condition has a sub-entry for impending or threatened, and also reference the main term entries for impending and threatened. So let's look at some examples of that. So if you go to the alphabetic index, there's actually only three entries for impending, impending coronary syndrome, impending delirium tremens, and impending myocardial infarction. We don't really have a lot for threatened either. There's threatened abortion, threatened job loss, threatened labor. 
and then threatened loss of job again, threatened miscarriage, and then threatened unemployment or anxiety concerning unemployment. If the subterms are listed, then we use that given code. If the subterms are not listed, we code the existing underlying conditions and not the condition described as impending or threatened. Reporting the same diagnosis code more than once, each unique ICD-10-CM diagnosis code may re be reported only once per encounter. This applies to bilateral conditions for when there are no distinct codes identifying laterality. So if there's only one code that doesn't give laterality and they have it on a right and a left, we still only use that code once, um, even though they may have that condition at two separate locations. We don't basically use the same diagnosis code twice on a claim, the exact same diagnosis code. Some ICD-10-CM codes indicate laterality, specifying whether the condition occurs on the right, left, or bilateral. If no bilateral code exists, use the code for the right and the code for the left. If we do not assign the right or left, if it doesn't say in the documentation, then use the unspecified side code. When a patient has a bilateral condition and each side is treated during separate encounters, assign the bilateral code as the conditions still exist on both sides, including for the encounter to treat the first side. For the second encounter for treatment after one side has been previously treated and no longer exists, which we do for cataracts, sometimes they're done uh, one first and then the other we do later. Once the uh, one has been cured completely, you only code for the side that still has the problem at it. The bilateral code wouldn't be assigned for those subsequent encounters because we've actually cured or treated that one eye. So documentation by clinicians other than the patient's provider. There are some instances where we can code based off documentation by nurses or dietitians, and we'll talk about that. So code assignment is based on the documentation by the patient's provider, so that physician, or if it's a CRNP or a PA, and that's the one who is legally accountable for determining that patient's diagnosis. And there are a few exceptions, such as BMI, depth of chronic ulcers, pressure ulcer, ulcer stage, coma scale, and the NIH stroke scale codes. Those can be based off of medical record documentation from clinicians who are not the patient's provider. So for example, if the patient's in a wound care clinic being seen by a wound nurse and she documents the type of chronic ulcer, you can abstract from that documentation per this section of the guideline. Uh, dietitians often document BMI for patients, even medical assistants I see that sometimes will document the patient's BMI. So that you can use, you can use that BMI code, however, uh, if the patient has a BMI that was documented by a dietitian and it's uh, a BMI of 40 and you know that means morbid obesity, you as the coder cannot abstract morbid obesity. That provider has to be the one that documents morbid obesity, that diagnosis, that associated diagnosis of that uh, condition. So you can code the BMI code, but you cannot code morbid obesity unless the provider diagnosis, diagnoses morbid obesity. Now, one thing I want to point out to you is this information here in bold, that is uh, new information. So this is something that has changed from the old guidelines in 2020, and these are new information for the 2021 guidelines. So it says for social determinants of health, such as those found in Z55 through Z65, persons with potential health hazards related to socioeconomic and psychosocial circumstances, code assignment may be based on medical record documentation from clinicians involved in the care of the patient who are not the patient's provider, since this information rep represents social information rather than a determined medical diagnosis. And now this is new, so pay attention. Patient self-reported documentation may also be used to assign codes for social determinants of health as long as the patient's self-reported information is signed off by and incorporated into the health record by either the clinician or provider. So let's look at those SDOH social determinants of health codes. So these are the codes they're talking about. This section here, persons with potential health hazards related to socioeconomic and psychosocial circumstances. So there are problems related to education and literacy, problems related to employment and unemployment. Over here we have um, ooh, uncongenial work environments. I hope none of you have that situation going on or any of these really in regards to your work uh, environment. Occupational exposure to risk factors, problems related to housing and economic circumstances, uh, things like extreme poverty, low income, lack of safe drinking water, 
um, problems adjusting to life cycle transitions, problems related to living alone even, problems related to upbringing, inadequate parental supervision and control, um, institutional uh, upbringing, upbringing away from parents, hostility towards scapegoating of a child, um, other problems related to upbringing. So there's a lot of things that factor in to why the patient may have health conditions but aren't necessarily diagnoses. And then it says the BMI coma scale NIHSS codes and categories from Z55 through Z65 should only be reported as secondary diagnoses. Syndromes. Follow the alphabetic index guidance when coding for syndromes. In the absence of an alphabetic index guidance, assign the code for the documented manifestations of that syndrome. Additional codes for manifestation that are not an integral part of that disease process may also be assigned when the condition does not have a unique code. Documentation of complications of care. Code assignment is based, again, on the provider's documentation of the relationship between the condition and the care of the procedure unless otherwise instructed by the classification. The guideline extends to any complication of care regardless of the chapter the code is located in. It is important to note that not all conditions that occurred during or following medical care or surgery are classified as complications. There must be a cause and effect relationship between the care provided and the condition and an indication of the documentation that is a complication. If you are unclear, query the provider if it is not clearly documented. So if the patient's post-operative and they have a rash or hallucinations or a hematoma and that's not normally associated with post-operative care for that condition, that would be something you would code for additionally. Borderline diagnoses. If the provider documents a borderline diagnosis at the time of discharge, the diagnosis is coded as confirmed unless the classification provides a specific entry, such as borderline diabetes. If a borderline condition has a specific entry in ICD-10-CM, it should be coded under that code that says borderline. Uh, since borderline conditions are not uncertain diagnoses, no distinction is made between the care setting, inpatient versus outpatient. Whenever the documentation is unclear regarding a borderline condition, you should query the provider. If you go to the alphabetic index, there's actually only five entries under borderline, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, osteopenia, pelvis with obstruction during labor, and personality. Use of signs and symptoms. Signs and symptoms and unspecified codes have acceptable uses. We oftentimes just are completely necessary to use them. But when we have that specific diagnosis, we should code it to the highest specificity whenever we can. So there are instances where we have to use the signs and symptoms if we don't have a definitive diagnosis or it's just unspecified in the documentation and we can't get any further definition of that. Each healthcare encounter should be coded to the level of certainty known for that encounter. Every note stands alone. If a definitive diagnosis has not yet been established by the end of the encounter, it is appropriate to report the codes for signs and symptoms in lieu of a definitive diagnosis. So remember, we talked about that patient that came in, they have abdominal pain, we don't know yet if it's appendicitis, if it's gallstones, if it's just gas. So when we have, uh, we don't have that definitive diagnosis by the time they leave and we've ended that encounter, we just use those signs and symptoms. Unspecified codes should be reported when they are the codes that most accurately reflect what we know at that patient encounter in that condition and what is documented. It would be inappropriate to select a specific code that is not supported by the medical record documentation, and it's also uh, inappropriate to conduct additional unnecessary testing just for the sake of getting a specified code. Now, coding for healthcare encounters in hurricane aftermath, this is what I'm gonna tell you guys. Remember how I talked about coding is not about knowing everything, it's about knowing where to find everything. So this is one of those things. You are, are depending on what you're doing in coding, very unlikely to deal with a ton of hurricane aftermath. If you do, uh, you're gonna know these guidelines very well, but for most of us, we won't need to know this. But if you come across something that's hurricane aftermath, just know that there is a guideline and where it is so that you can reference back to it. So just know that that hurricane aftermath code is in there. So even if you're sitting for your CPC exam and it asks you a hurricane related incident question, you can quick refer back and make sure that you've got this correct. So 
use of external cause of morbidity codes. An external cause of morbidity code should be assigned to identify the cause of injuries incurred in, as a result of a hurricane. The use of external cause of morbidity codes is supplemental to the application of ICD-10-CM codes. External cause of morbidity codes are never to be recorded as the principal diagnosis, meaning first listed in the inpatient setting. The appropriate injury code should be sequenced before any external cause codes. The external cause of morbidity capture how the injury or health condition happened, the cause, the intent, unintentional or accidental, and the place the event occurred. So all of those codes that are like place of occurrence, patient's home, or uh, location of occurrence um, in the prison, or the, it was related to a skiing accident, those are not to be used as first listed diagnosis. They're like supplemental information. So they're always sequenced secondary. Usually, actually, we usually sequence them at the end of the, the code reporting. They should not be assigned for encounters to treat hurricane victims, medical conditions when no injury, adverse effect, or poisoning is involved. External cause of morbidity codes should be assigned for each encounter for care and treatment of the injury. External cause of morbidity codes should be assigned in all healthcare settings. For the purpose of capturing complete and accurate ICD-10 CM data in the aftermath of a hurricane, a healthcare setting should be considered as any location where medical care is provided by licensed healthcare professionals. Sequencing of external causes of morbidity codes. Codes for cataclysmic events such as a hurricane take priority over all other external cause codes. Remember, we're just talking about the external cause codes, not about all other codes, but about all other external cause codes. Except for child and, and adult abuse and terrorism, those should be sequenced before other external cause codes. Assign as many external cause codes and morbidity codes as necessary to fully explain the cause. So this is a lot of the stuff about painting that picture of what happened to that patient. For example, if an injury occurs as a result of a building collapse during a hurricane, the external cause codes both for the hurricane and the building collapse should be assigned with the external cause codes for the hurricane being sequenced first as the external cause code. And for injuries incurred as a direct result of the hurricane, we assign the appropriate codes for the injuries, followed by the code X370, hurricane, and any other applicable external causes of injury codes. Code X370 should also be assigned when an injury is incurred as a result of flooding caused by a levee breaking related to a hurricane. Code X38, which is flood with the appropriate extra characters, should be assigned when an injury is from flooding resulting directly from the storm. X36 is for collapse of dam or man-made structure that should not be assigned where the cause of the collapse is due to the hurricane and use of code x36 is limited to collapses of man-made structures due to earth surface movements not related to storm damages from a hurricane other external causes of morbidity code issues for injuries that are not a direct result of that hurricane we're still on hurricanes here guys such as an evacuee that has uh, incurred an injury as a result of a motor vehicle accident, assign the appropriate external cause and morbidity code to describe the cause of the injury, but not to do not assign code X37, which is hurricane. If it's unclear whether the injury was a direct result from that hurricane or um, something else, assume the injury is due to the, the hurricane and assign X370 as well as any applicable external cause of morbidity codes in addition to code x370 hurricane as other possible external causes of morbidity codes include for example w54.0 bitten by dog x30 exposure to excessive natural heat x31 exposure to excessive natural cold x38 which is flood and now Z code, so our other reasons for healthcare encounters, may also be assigned to further explain reasons presenting for healthcare services, including transfer between healthcare facilities. And again, we're still on hurricanes. This is all part of this section here about coding for healthcare encounters and hurricane aftermath. So the use of Z codes may be assigned as appropriate to further explain the reasons presenting for the healthcare services, including transfers between healthcare facilities. ICD-10-CM guidelines for coding and reporting identify which codes may be assigned as principal or first listed only, secondary only, or principal slash first listed or secondary, depending on the circumstances. So some possible applicable Z codes would include homelessness, inadequate housing, extreme poverty, a uh, person awaiting uh, admission to adequate facility elsewhere, unavailability of uh, healthcare facilities, 
unavailability of and inaccessibility of other helping agencies, encounter for health supervision and care of healthy infant and child, encounter for a respirator or ventilator dependence during a power failure. The external cause of morbidity codes and the Z code list listed apply are not an all exclusive list. Other codes may be applicable to the encounter based upon the documentation. Assign as many codes as necessary to fully explain each healthcare encounter. Since patient history information may be very limited if they're in a hurricane, use any available documentation to assign the appropriate external cause of morbidity and Z codes. And that's the end of that part. Next, it goes starts getting into the chapter specific coding guidelines. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, make sure you give it a big thumbs up, share it with your friends that need some support in coding too, and make sure you support the channel by hitting that subscribe button. And you will want to hit that notification bell because you're going to want to get alerts when I'm posting all the rest of the episodes in this series. I will see you in the next episode. And until then, just keep on coding on.